Hey guys, so today we're going to go ahead and build off our presentation from last class going over uh, universal gravitation. And today we're going to look at gravitational interactions. Now, I'm going to try and include a lot related to astronomy today. That was one of the big things that kind of led me to physics in the first place and got me interested in it was the physics of outer space. And so there are some pretty cool and important applications of what we've been discussing in terms of how gravitational interactions occur. So let's go ahead, jump right in and see what we can learn about what gravity can do. Essential question number one, what is a field? Is it a real or a the theoretical construct? Now, when we start taking a look at fields, this is not the last time we'll see this. In next term, we'll go ahead and take a look at electric fields at least, and if we have time, magnetic fields. Okay, number two, what is the Roche limit? And how does this impact moon ring formation? When we start looking at planets like Saturn, this Roche limit comes in big. And so we have to understand what it is, what it does, and how that relates to gravity. Number three, what is the process that leads to black holes? How does our sun fit into this life cycle? So they have what's called the stellar life cycle. And depending on the mass or size of the star, we're going to see it have the ability to either become a planetary nebula or to supernova and produce either a neutron star or a black hole. But what exactly determines that and where, do sun, where does our sun fit on that spectrum? And then lastly, number four, what is the Chandrasekhar limit and what does that tell us? This actually relates to the question before, and so we'll cover that when we get there. So what is a field? Uh, if you've ever played with iron filings or in a magnet, you already are familiar with a magnetic field. A magnetic field is a force field that surrounds a magnet. A force field exerts a force on objects within its vicinity. A magnetic field exerts a magnetic force on magnetic substances. A gravitational field, however, is a force field that surrounds objects that have mass. The greater the mass, the greater the gravitational field. So we can go ahead and draw what we call field lines or lines of strength based on the distance away from whatever the body is that has mass. Now this could be something nice and round, uh, like a ball, this could be bigger like a planet, or it could be something that doesn't have a traditional shape like some sort of space shuttle. As we walk on the surface of the earth, it pulls on us and we pull back on it. But since the earth is so much more massive than we are, the pull from us is not strong enough to move the earth, while the pull from the earth can make us fall on our faces, okay? Now, again, I keep coming back to this, but it's important that we keep in mind the four fundamental forces. Okay? If you remember, the four fundamental forces are broken down into categories that we can recognize. So let's go ahead and start. Number one, if you remember, is the strong nuclear force. Okay. Number two, and I'm putting them in order by strength, is the weak nuclear force. And we are not going to spend a lot of time talking about these in physics. We'll save those for when you go ahead and take chemistry class. These are the strongest of the four fundamental forces, but they are finite in their reach. So finite in their reach. What we're going to focus on in this course is really the last two. Number three, the electromagnetic force. Or EMF. And four, the one we're dealing with right now, the gravitational force. Now, this is the weakest of the four fundamental forces, but both of these are unique in the fact that while they are not as strong as the strong and weak nuclear force, they are infinite. They do not ever end, and so that attraction gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And this is where we introduced you last class to what we call the inverse square law. And that was the one over R squared. Okay, so that we go ahead and produce a parabolic graph where we see diminishing returns, something like this. 
Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about field strength and how this works. You've already kind of seen it in just our demonstration there, but essentially the gravitational field of Earth exists inside the Earth as well as outside of it. If you were able to descend towards the center and continue out the opposite side of the Earth, you'd be able to appreciate that the Earth's gravitational field increases as you approach the center of mass. Now, this is true for all objects, and so this is one of the reasons that we teach you about the center of mass and use this as the acting point for forces when we do our free body diagrams. The distance is inversely proportional to the field strength. That's that inverse square law, and you can see it demonstrated in the graphic here on the slide. So what would happen if you were to actually be able to fall through the Earth, and how would that work? So if we draw our Earth here, real rudimentary, and I'm going to put a little tunnel. Not that this could happen because of our molten core, etc. But if you were to be an object or person falling through, what you would see is that you would fall faster and faster and faster until you pass that midpoint. And then your acceleration would actually be in the opposite direction. So you'd be decelerating as you came down towards the bottom. So you would speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up, slow down, slow down, slow down until you hit the other side. And then you'd kind of do this oscillation. And if we assume that there is friction, you'd keep going back and forth, back and forth until you kind of got stuck at the center. So this idea of field strength is based on the idea of the center of mass and that being the origin of the force itself. Okay. So let's take a look at planetary rings. Four of the planets in our solar system have a system of planetary rings, and Mars probably did at some point. Saturns are probably the most dominant, and these are likely caused due to tidal forces of gravity. And so what happened is a satellite experiences competing forces as it gets closer and closer to a larger mass, and these tidal forces begin to kind of rip and tear and rend it apart. And the gravity that holds the object together is not strong enough to overcome these, leaving behind the little scattered remains, which become the actual ring system. In the early life of the solar system, Saturn and the other outer planets may have once had more moons orbiting them. I know they have far more than the rocky planets already, in the order of 60 plus moons in most cases. Um, but when we start looking at this, those tides stretch those innermost moons that are too close to the planet, and they get elongated and elongated until they actually rip to pieces. And during billions of years, those fragments are separated into billions and billions of still smaller, tiny little pieces and spread out to form the ring system that we see today. Our moon is sufficiently far away to resist this tidal disintegration. Those moons that exist in the outer portion around these other gas giants are far enough out to not see this problem. There is, however, the potential that one of Mars's moons, which has a dying orbit, meaning it's getting closer and closer to the planet, may get to a point where it does get to this, what we call the Roche limit, and begins to go ahead and start to tear apart or elongate the moons until it destroys it. So you're looking at an example of this. So the Roche limit is essentially a distance away from the size of the orbit, uh, the size of the planet. and if something gets close to that point, it's going to go ahead and begin to elongate and stretch and deform until it finally reaches the Roche limit, uh, which is designated here with the dotted line, and it disintegrates the object. And this point is located 2.44 times the planet's radius from its center. Okay, so we can predict the point at which an object that is being distorted or stretched by the gravitational tides of the planet gets so deformed that it actually causes the disintegration of the body and it forms what eventually could become a ring system like we see on Saturn. Okay. Now, we think of the rings when we see them from Earth as being incredibly smooth, but in all actuality, they're made up of a whole bunch of tiny rocky fragments of ice and debris, and that's what you're seeing here. This is an actual photograph of the rocky material 
that is found in the rings of Saturn. Now, I don't know if you've actually seen pictures or studied closely the pictures of the rings of Saturn, but in fact, it has several rings that are identified. And as you go ahead and look at those rings, they are broken up in some cases by what may have been an old moon that ruptured into them, or in some cases, a still intact moon. You can see here that the E ring is the one that we see around the different planets as you get toward, uh, not planets, but moons, as you get out towards Mimas and Celadus and Tethys, okay? Uh, they have what's identified as the Cassini division. You can see a little gap there. You can see the Enki division, the Enki gap, okay? And you've got rings A, B, C, D, and F, okay? Which has actual moons in it, Prometheus and Pandora. All of Saturn's main rings lie inside the Roche limit. This is the main rings, not the lesser rings that are out or farther, within which the planet's gravity will tear large satellites apart. The A and B rings have been observed for centuries. The more tenuous C ring was discovered in the 19th century, and definite observations of the transparent D ring awaited the arrival of Voyager 1 spacecraft on November 12th of 1980. The icy satellite Enceladus probably fed, feeds the tenuous E-ring, also revealed from Voyager. For clarity, the thickness of the rings has been exaggerated to go ahead and make it easier for you to see here. So if tidal forces in terms of gravity can actually go ahead and rip apart solar bodies, these meteors, these moons, what happens when you get incredibly big masses like that of a star? Now, a star is a sphere of gas held together by its own gravity. And the closest star to our Earth is our own sun. So we have a good example that nearby astronomers have been able to study. Now, the lesson we learn about the sun can most likely be applied to other stars. And what we've discovered as we started looking at other stars around our solar system not in our solar system, but around our solar system, uh, but definitely inside of our galaxy, the Milky Way, is that there's a fair amount of diversity. And as we've studied some of these other stars, we started to realize that there is a constant struggle inside the star against the force of gravity. Now, gravity is trying to pull all of this material together to collapse the star. But at the same time, you're getting a nuclear fusion reaction, which is pushing energy and pushing outward on the star. So gravity constantly works to collapse the star, whereas the nuclear furnace is trying to keep the star expanding. The star's core, however, is incredibly hot, which creates pressures within the gas, and the pressures counteract this force of gravity, putting the star into a condition we call hydrostatic equilibrium. Now, as long as the equilibrium between gravity and the internal pressure of the nuclear furnace stays static, you get a balance between this, the two forces and the star does not collapse inwards or explode outwards. But it doesn't always stay that way. That is not necessarily the end point of the life of a star. For during most of the star's life, the interior heat and radiation provided by these nuclear reactions keeps the star in what we call the main sequence. Now, our sun is part of the main sequence. It's what they would consider a small main sequence yellow star. But before a star reaches the main sequence, the star is contracting and its core is not yet hot enough or dense enough to begin these nuclear reactions. So until it reaches the main sequence, Hydrostatic support is provided by the heat generated from the contraction of all the material pulling together. And this is what occurs inside what's called a planetary nebula, okay, or a stellar nursery. At some point, the star will run out of materials as it continues along this main sequence. And when it runs out of enough material to continue these nuclear reactions, if the star is large enough, it will go through a series of much less efficient nuclear reactions. Uh, if you look at the periodic table, there's a great example of this. The standard reactions in a star 
during its normal lifetime will go up through essentially iron and lead. But in the most massive stars, they will actually go through these kind of death throws as they start doing less efficient nuclear reactions, producing every element that you see on the periodic table. Now, this is why all the things above that are much less common in their concentrations around the universe than those below it, because all stars are able to make those below it. Those above are only in the most massive of stars. As you start getting into these less efficient nuclear reactions, you're no longer able to generate the pressure and heat to support the star from collapsing against its own gravity. And what happens is as the star begins to die, you see a collapse. And it collapses in on itself until you get to those nuclear reactions and then it explodes outward. Now, if you're dealing with a small sun-like star, you're gonna take the left path here. It grows into what's called a red giant. And as it goes through the collapse, it produces what's known as a planetary nebula. The star itself will eventually fade into a white dwarf the casing for it will produce a star forming nebula, which has the ability to produce new stars in the future. If you're looking at a massive star, the massive star is going to become a super giant, which will be big enough that when that collapse occurs, it produces a supernova, sheds material out into the universe. And if it's just above what we'll talk about in a minute here, the Chandrasekhar limit, it will form a neutron star. But if it's significantly above the Chandrasekhar limit, it will actually collapse even further upon itself to produce a black hole, okay? So when a medium-sized star, this is about seven times the mass of the sun, reaches the red giant phase of its life, the core will have enough heat and pressure to cause helium to fuse into carbon, giving the core a brief reprieve from its collapse. Once the helium in the core, however, is gone, the star will begin to shed most of its mass, forming a cloud of material known as a planetary nebula. The core of the star will cool and shrink under its own gravity, leaving behind a tiny little hot white ball called a white dwarf. A white dwarf doesn't collapse against its own gravity because the pressure of the electrons repelling each other within its core. Okay, so now we're running into those other nuclear forces, strong, weak nuclear force, they're going to keep this from collapsing any further, and we are left with a white dwarf. However, if you go bigger, a red giant star with over seven times the mass of the sun, that limit, that seven times the mass of the sun is what's known as the Chandrasekhar limit, is fated for a much more uh, spectacular ending. These high mass stars go through some of the same steps as the medium mass stars, first swelling, but instead of just to a red giant, they swell to a red super giant. And then the core shrinks becoming really hot and dense. We continue that fusion of helium to carbon begins in core. When the supply of helium runs out, the core will contract again and the higher mass allows the carbon to fuse into neon and further until iron. And when it hits that point of iron, we get to an energy output as the star is trying to fight off gravity. So fusing iron requires a huge amount of input of energy. And rather than producing excess energy, a core full of iron, the star will lose the fight against gravity, collapse in on itself, and then the core temperature rises over 100 billion degrees as the iron atoms are crushed together. The nuclear forces are overcome by gravity and send out a huge shock wave. This is what's known as a supernova and spews the stellar remnants into outer space. About 75% of the star is expelled into the universe, mixing with other uh, nebula that are, exist already out there, forming what will be the next stars. The remaining mass is condensed into either a neutron star if the star begins seven to 20 times the mass of our sun, or if it's over 20 times the mass of our sun, it will collapse even further upon itself, neutron star is not small enough, and create what we call a black hole. 
So a neutron star is what it sounds like. A neutron star is a star whose core is essentially a ton of neutrons. The protons and electrons have been pushed so close together that they touch and their charges neutralize. And so all you have is a big, massive core of neutrons. If we go back to what we discussed in terms of our investigations of gravity last class, we now know that gravity is a force created by the attraction of two masses and that the greater the mass of the objects, the greater the gravity. Remember, mass is how we measure the amount of matter in something. So now think about the pull of our sun and of a star that would produce a black hole, okay? Remember, a black hole is about 25 times the size of our sun. Think about then a supermassive black hole. Yes, they exist. These are what are at the core of a galaxy. This is the mass of several black holes. So now you're looking at something that's massive to the point of hundreds times the size of our sun or even more than that. And now condense that into the tiny point that's the singularity of a black hole. So in addition to depending on the amount of mass, gravity also depends on how far you are from something. This is why we are stuck to the surface of the Earth instead of being pulled off into the sun. The sun has many more times the gravity of Earth, but because it's so far away, it's so much weaker. Remember, inverse square law. Gravity has played a big part in making the universe form the way it has. It's gravity that brings together these clumps of matter that will eventually form the planets, the moons, the stars. And it's gravity that makes the planets orbit the other stars, like Earth orbiting our sun. It's what makes the moons orbit their planets, like the moon orbiting the Earth. This is what makes the stars clump together and whirl around in these big, beautiful spiral or elliptical galaxies. Now, interestingly enough, a black hole is no more massive than the star from which it collapsed. And in fact, the gravitational field near the black hole may be enormous, but the field beyond the original radius of the star is no different than before the collapse. Because the amount of mass has not changed, the concentration of the mass is what has changed. So if you were somehow able to avoid the supernova explosion or have it not happen when a star collapses at the end of its life to form a black hole, <coughs> excuse me, anything that was orbiting the star at that point of its death would continue to orbit the black hole in the exact same way. Because again, remember that the field, the gravitational field, has not changed around it. What's changed is how concentrated all that material is. It's now been collapsed into that tiny singularity rather than being an object the size of a planet or a star. So there is a point where the collapse brings that body in so much that it becomes so dense that not even light can escape. This point at which that gravity becomes so strong that not even light can escape is known as the event horizon. And current physics does not really know what exists beyond that point. We have theories and ideas, but beyond that, we leave the realm of experimental science and head towards the theoretical. So while black holes can't be seen, their effects can. Based on the observations of astronomers, some black holes appear to be more massive than a million suns, like the supermassive black holes we were talking about before. And in fact, if you go ahead and do any research on the Milky Way galaxy of which we're part, at the center of the Milky Way seems to be one such example. Inside the radio lobe appears to be a supermassive black hole with some of these stars orbiting at breakneck speeds as they go ahead and encircle that central singularity. So today, 
I feel like I should leave you with a little bit of relativity, okay? It's the existence of these types of massive stars and massive black holes that led to the next real change in our understanding of gravity. Remember, Newtonian physics did a pretty good job of describing this. In fact, we still use the Newtonian model to help explain a lot of things that we see in the world around us. But when it gets to the very large or the very fast if we're approaching the speed of light, we need to rely on a different set of parameters established by Einstein. Um, Einstein lived in the 20th century and he had a new idea about gravity. He thought that gravity is what happens when space itself is curved or warped around a mass, such as a star or a planet. If this is true, then a star or a planet would cause a kind of dip in the fabric of space-time, and any other objects that came too close to that dip would tend to fall in the dip. And while this is a little oversimplified to help visualize it, this is kind of what general relativity uh, teaches us. So when we think about twirling a ball on the end of a string around our head, there's that string holding the ball in. Well, when it comes to gravity, there is no string holding that ball in, providing that centripetal force. That centripetal force is actually caused by the warping of the fabric of space itself. Okay, and so what you're seeing here is, is some of what that is. And this was actually verified by an experiment called Gravity Pro B, which has a fascinating history and almost didn't happen itself. So if you're looking for more information, on how we've validated relativity, um, in particular general relativity, look up Gravity Probe B, and I think you'll be impressed at some of the cool stuff that comes up there. All right, guys, so our big takeaways for today, when we stake a look at gravity, gravity creates all these attractions we learned about last class, but that is what allows for the formation of stars, for the formation of planets, um, and for the formation of moons. But if those objects get too close, right? If we're talking about a moon that gets too close to the planet, if it crosses that Roche limit, it gets ripped apart and it can become essentially a ring system. And we have that around all of our gas giants. And at some point in the future, we may have one around Mars as one of its moons is beginning to have an orbital degra degradation, okay? When a star goes through its life cycle, it's balancing the nuclear fusion in its heart with the gravitational collapse of the material that makes up the star. And at least for the majority of the life of the star, those two balance each other out. In fact, the nuclear reactions may be strong enough to continue to expand it outward. Eventually, it will get to be what's called a red giant or a red supergiant before it goes into its death throes. If it's Above the Chandrasekhar limit, it will become a neutron star, a black hole. If it's below the Chandrasekhar limit, like our sun, it will become a planetary nebula. And when you look at these, a black hole is essentially a neutron star that continued to collapse to the point where it took all of the neutrons that make up the heart of that star and crushed them together to the point where it became so dense that even light couldn't escape creating that event horizon with what we predict to be the singularity inside of it. Okay, guys, that's all I've got for you today. I hope you take care of yourselves. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.